Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're taking a look at cardiac action potentials. Taking a look at the different cells of the heart and how they depolarize, how they send signals in order for the heart muscle to ultimately contract. Let's take a look. So to begin, you need to understand that the heart itself is made up of two major types of cells. Cells that we call contractile cells, these are the cells that can actually contract to allow for the blood to be pumped, and conductile cells, the ones that send the signal and can set the rate and rhythm of the heart. Let's take a look at the heart that we've drawn up here. So what we've got just to orientate ourselves, here's the apex of the heart, here's the base of the heart, which is the top of the heart strangely, and we've got our atria and our ventricles here. First thing you need to understand is that all of this here is myocardium, that is heart muscle cell. This is contractile tissue. This is the, these are the cells that when we trigger an action potential, they'll contract. So the protein filaments inside, will form a cross bridge and contract. So they're the contractile cells. But we also have conductile cells. And the conductile cells include those of the SA node, which we've got here, which stands for sinoatrial node. And we've got the AV node here, which is the atrioventricular node. These two types of cells are known as conductile cells, and they send signals, and they basically set that rate and rhythm of the heart. They will spread that action potential or signal throughout the tissue of the heart setting the rate and rhythm. So we've got our contractile, we've got our conductile. So what I've drawn up here, here is a conductile cell, also known as a nodal cell. Let's write it down. So this is a conductile cell, also known as a nodal cell. So SA node or AV node also known as a pacemaker cell. It sets the rhythm of the heart. We'll get there in a sec. And here we have a contractile cell. Contractile cell. So this is myocardium or a myocyte, right? Specifically, you'd say it's a cardiomyocyte. All right, we'll talk about these graphs in a sec. That's the graph for the conductile. This is the graph for the contractile. First thing you must understand is that all cells of the body have a charge difference across its membrane. Now, this is really important, especially for excitable cells or excitable tissues. Excitable tissues include nervous tissue, muscle tissue, endocrine tissue. They're excitable meaning they can be at rest and not do anything, but if you excite them or trigger them, they can then do something. So neurons cannot send a signal or you excite them and they'll send a signal for communication. Muscle cells cannot do anything, you excite them, your muscles contract, you perform work. Endocrine tissues, they cannot release a hormone, you excite them, they can release a hormone like insulin into the bloodstream, right? Makes sense. So these are muscle tissues, what we've got all muscle cells, specifically cardiac. So there's skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. The cardiac muscle cells will contract similarly to that of skeletal muscle, if you understand skeletal muscle contraction. Now, the thing is, how do we generate this charge difference across the membrane? Here's the first thing. You must understand that. Sitting outside of our cells, we've got sodium. And sitting inside the cells, we've got potassium predominantly. Let's have a look at this, right? In the membrane of every single cell of our body, we have a pump. This very important pump is called the sodium potassium ATPase pump. It's called that because it uses ATP, an energy source to throw, what we do is we throw three sodium outside, one, two, three. So let, I'll draw it up. We've got one sodium, two sodium, three sodium, and it exchanges, exchanges it for two potassium. One, two. All right. Three sodium outside, two potassium inside. That's three positive things outside, two positive things inside. If you were to compare the charge difference, where would most of the positive charge be at this time? Outside. So you would say that the outside of the membrane here, compared to the inside, is slightly positive, comparatively, right? Makes sense. But this only contributes a small amount of charge difference. What you're also gonna find embedded in the membrane is another channel. And this channel is a potassium channel. Now remember, most of the potassium is inside the cell, right? Because of this sodium potassium pump. And this channel is leaky, so the door and the lid is just 
cracked open a little bit. And you know diffusion. Diffusion is the movement of ions down their concentration gradient. So that means if we've got all this potassium inside, where most of it is, it's gonna slowly diffuse out. Now think about that. Positive potassium is diffusing out, carrying its positive charge with it, making the outside even more positive compared to inside. And this is how we generate what we term the resting membrane potential, the charge difference. Because there's a difference of charge from the outside compared to the inside regarding voltage, we call this polarized. So the cell membrane is polarized. Remember that point, let's write this down. It's polarized. So if somebody has polarizing views, it means it's different. So the cell membrane by charge is polarized. All right. This isn't just what happens in a conductile or nodal cell. This is actually what happens in all the cells of our body, especially the excitable cells of our body. So now we've generated this charge difference. Super important. So I'm gonna do it like this. Now, not only, like I said, the conductile cells, but the contractile cells have this charge difference too. So let's write that up. And it's a charge difference simply across the membrane. It's not within the entire cell, it's just across the membrane. All right, now what we wanna do is this. Remember, the heart needs to contract. The heart, unlike neurons or skeletal muscle, right, which need to be told to contract, the heart can do it by itself. It has, intrin it has the intrinsic ability to spontaneously send signals to contract. So let's start with the SA node. This is known as the pacemaker cells that sets the rhythm of the heart can be between 60 to 100 times it sends this signal. So how does it do it without anyone telling it what's going on? Well, we've got the graph here. What you need to understand with this graph is that at rest, now I'm gonna clarify this point, at rest, a conductile cell is probably sitting in around about negative 60 millivolts. But the problem here is that conductile cells are never at rest. Then they don't have what we call a resting membrane potential. A neuron does, right? A neuron will either fire a signal or not. And when it's not firing a signal, it has its resting membrane potential that it just sits at until it gets told to send a signal. Same with skeletal muscle, but not conductile cells. So what happens with conductile cells is they have a couple of more channels. So they've got a channel here, which is called a funny sodium channel. Weird name called a funny sodium channel. Now the funny sodium channel, similar to that leaky potassium channel, its lid is open a little bit. And what that means is, because we know all the sodium, or most of the sodium is outside, that sodium's gonna leak in. So sodium is slowly leaking in, which means, at all times, these conductile cells are drifting into the positive, because it's bringing the positive charge with it. Right, So we start low at negative 60 because the inside's negative compared to the outside. But as we bring the positive sodium in, it makes it a little bit more positive and it slowly brings it up towards the positive. Now, here's an important point. Negative 40 is what we term the threshold. Now, when I say threshold, it's basically a key. It's a voltage key that will open a new channel, right? So. Once enough sodium has leaked in through these funny sodium channels and hits negative 40, it opens another type of channel. Now this is a type of channel of an ion we haven't spoken about yet, calcium. Calcium, most of it sits outside the cell, but we do have calcium inside the cell, which we'll talk about shortly. Once we hit negative 40, we open a calcium channel. Now the thing is the calcium channel is voltage gated. So just like you've got a gate on the front of your house that needs a key to open it, well the key isn't a physical key in this case, it's a charge. And the key must fit negative 40 millivolts. And so that's the key, once we hit negative 40, that's the key, it opens the lid for the calcium channel once it hits negative 40 millivolts and calcium will diffuse inside. Now calcium channels are relatively slow. Right? And so what that means is, once we hit that negative 40, the calcium doesn't rush in super quick, but it does go up until we hit around about positive 10 millivolts, which means enough positive calcium has gone inside that it's gone from being negative to positive. 
So remember, we started off as polarized. If you change that, right, it's now depolarized because now it's both are positive. So it's now depolarized, which means this first phase that we've got here of both the sodium coming in, that sodium coming in, and the calcium coming in, we call this first phase depolarization. So now we've got depolarization happening. That's important. Once we hit around about positive 10, the calcium channels close. And what we have is positive 10 is another key to open another channel. This channel are potassium channels. And again, at around about positive 10, give or take, opens those channels. Where's most of the potassium? Inside. So the potassium will leak outside, carrying that positive charge with it. And what do you think that means? It means it makes it negative inside again. Dun, 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 dun. And it drops back down. Back to it being negative inside and positive outside. So we go from being depolarized to repolarized. So this side is repolarization. So if I were to separate that out like this, this side is repolarization and this side is depolarization. What's the whole point of this? The whole point is this, right? What we've done by doing this is we've thrown positive sodium inside and positive calcium inside. Now here's the great thing. Our nodal cells of our SA node are connected to the myocardium, the muscle cells, the contractile cells. So here's a contractile cell. They're connected through what we call gap junctions. Gap junctions, we've got a gap junction there. And in actual fact, this contractile cell is connected to the next through a gap junction and so forth. And what that means is, this positive sodium and potassium, what do you think it will do? It'll diffuse. They'll go down their concentration gradient where there's not enough of them and they'll bring their charges with them. Okay, now they're bringing their charges with them and what do you think that means for this polarized membrane? It will become depolarized itself. Now here's the thing, that is the action potential, this whole thing is the action potential for the conductile cell. But it's different for a contractile cell and we'll explain why shortly. So now the sodium and calcium are coming. Here's the thing, we've still got the sodium potassium pump throwing three sodium out and two potassium in, and we've got the leaky potassium channel throwing the potassium out, generating that resting membrane potential here. So it has a resting membrane potential, unlike the conductile cell that constantly drifts, right? So what's gonna happen after this? It drifts again because of these funny sodium channels being open, and then the whole thing happens again. It's just, and this happens 60 to 100 times a minute. Right, let's say 80 times a minute. It's just constant, so what, this is called spontaneous depolarization. It doesn't need to be told to do this. It'll just do it because of these funny sodium channels. So, but for the contractile cell, it doesn't spontaneously depolarize. It does have a resting membrane potential, which is at negative 90. It's at negative 90. It's here. So it cannot contract. It cannot send a signal. It cannot have an action potential and stay there. But once this calcium and sodium start moving in, it's gonna make this part of the membrane slightly positive. Now remember the threshold. This threshold's different. It's around about negative 70. The threshold is a key, remember? So we've got the threshold here. Now once enough sodium and, and calcium have moved in to hit that threshold, negative 70 is the key to open a new channel. Now this channel is a sodium channel and it's really fast. It's a fast sodium channel. Now remember the sodium's outside. So what happens? Sodium rushes inside really quickly, really quickly carrying that charge with it, which means it goes, phew, spikes right up, super quick. Now once it hits, and this is variable, but around about positive 20 millivolts-ish, what it's gonna do is those sodium channels will close and it will open two other channels. Two channels open up, right? Interestingly, one is a calcium channel and one is a potassium channel. So, 
remember, what did I say? Where's calcium? Mostly outside. Where's potassium? Mostly inside. Oh, weird. Okay, so the potassium is going to leak out, right, down its concentration gradient, carrying that positive charge with it. So it starts to slowly drop, but then we've got the calcium channels open. Calcium channels are slow. So the calcium will slowly move in. But it hits a point where there's an equilibrium of positive things in and positive things out, and it starts to form a plateau like this. Now this lasts for around about 200 milliseconds, right? So it's nice and slow because the calcium's moving in really slow. Then what's going to happen is the calcium channels will close. And once the calcium channels close, the potassium channels remain open and the rest of the potassium will leak out, right? So we've got potassium out. And then here we've got both potassium out and calcium in at the same time. And here we've got sodium in. So remember the depolarization, repolarization phase, depolarization, repolarization, and that's what we call the plateau, the plateau phase. And the plateau phase is actually quite important. And especially the fact that it lasts for a while is the absolute refractory period. So the absolute refractory period is the time period in which you can't send another action potential. Why do we want it to be quite long for contractile cells? Because we need the time for it to contract. But not only that, it's connected to the next cell. And how does a heart contract? Do each cells contract, 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 or do they contract together as what we call a syncytium? Yeah, it's like an orchestra, they have to play together. They set, get a signal and they need to be timed. And this absolute refractory period is important for the timing because what we want is for the muscles, the myocardium to contract in unison. And it's because of this gap junction. Now we've got, again, the positive sodium, positive calcium in. We need them to move and send the next action potential to the next myocardium. And this break allows for it all to catch up and contract as a syncytium, right? So syncytium means many act as one. And so let's think about another point, calcium. All right, calcium is used here for the depolarization phase and calcium is also used here as well, but it's different. The calcium is used here and it's slow influx and that's important to set a rhythm. If it's really fast like this one, your intrinsic heart rate's gonna to be too quick, right? So to use calcium in the depolarization phase because it's slower for the influx allows for you to set a constant rate and rhythm that isn't too quick. But calcium isn't used here for the contractile cells for that purpose. Calcium is used here because these, muscle, these are muscle cells, they need to contract. Muscle contraction won't happen without calcium. Calcium must go into a cell and tell this muscle cell to contract. So this plateau phase is associated with contraction. So this pretty much from here to here is when it, the muscle contracts. So that's it, and that has to do with calcium influx. Now remember that most of the calcium required for contraction actually doesn't come from outside. It actually sits inside in these membranes that we call, we use, well, we generally call in other cells endoplasmic reticulum, but in muscle cells, we call it the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarco is referring to flesh, so it's referring to muscle, sarcoplasmic reticulum. And in muscle cells, the sarcoplasmic reticulum doesn't play the role that other sarcoplasmic reticula play, it stores calcium. And so when the cell gets depolarized, it will release huge amounts of calcium into the cell where the contractile units are, right? Actinomycin, and tell them to contract. So the calcium here is used for the contraction aspect and the calcium here is used to create the rhythm and the slower signals, which means think about the clinical applications of this. A conductile cell or a nodal cell setting the rhythm, if you block the calcium, you're gonna slow the heart rate because it makes the influx even slower, so the heart rate slows. But if you block calcium for the myocardial cells or the contractile cells, it's going to reduce the force of contraction. Hopefully that makes sense. So 
This is looking at the difference of the action potentials between the conductile or nodal cells and the contractile or myocardial cells of the heart. I hope you enjoyed it. Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you want to contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.